Okay, so we shall begin. Okay, okay thank, uh, thank you for joining us. So today, hello all. Uh, to, today's issue is TMY's review March on artist and afterlife, which is very special for us as in this way, we actually uh, wish to tr uh, pay our tribute to the gone artists uh, that we have lost in 2020. And uh, they have been a six wonderful artists from different regions that we have lost. And we, we would like to cherish our memories of, of them by uh, bringing in this series of TMY's Review March. So uh, today's session is centered around the late choreographer and icon, Saroj Khan. So for that, we have with us uh, reputed professor, Dr. Tejaswini Ganti. She's an associate professor at New York University. And we have uh, research students, Arpita Bajpai from York University. And we have Meeta Bandhu Pradhai from NIT Durgapur. So uh, I would, without much further ado, I would like to uh, also bring attention of our listeners and readers towards that uh, our TMY's review March issue is also available on Kindle and uh, Amazon worldwide. So uh, let's begin. And uh, so for this, I would like to ask Professor Tejaswini Ganti, that how, uh, who has also authored uh, Beyond Bollywood and writings on Bollywood, which, uh, which actually sheds her perspective on cultural, popular cinema uh, and its impact on Western influences. So uh, Professor Ganti, I would like to ask that, how do you actually perceive the contribution of uh, Saroj Khan towards the landscape of Bollywood and especially as a feminist icon. Um, so one, thank you. Um, so uh, just one correction. Uh, the name of my book uh, is Producing Bollywood. Beyond Bollywood is someone else's book. Um, so yeah, so my book is called Producing Bollywood Inside the Contemporary Hindi Film Industry. Um, it's uh, thank you for inviting me to um, comment upon this session. And I think um, Saroj Khan, you know, is an incredibly interesting person and, you know, such a landmark figure in, in popular Hindi cinema. And what I really, um, what I really welcomed was the opportunity to go back and actually revisit some of her work by watching some of the, you know, wonderful song sequences that she had choreographed. And also uh, for those people out there who haven't seen, um, I highly recommend the the documentary about her mm -hmm. called the Saroj Khan story that uh, PSBT uh, had uh, produced. It came out in uh, 2012, I believe, uh, or 2014. I, I can't. Yeah, 2012. Um, it's available on YouTube. Um, and so, just you know, revisiting revisiting her life, it really hit home to me uh, what an incredible trailblazer um, she had been. Uh, in the field of choreography, um, as you know, many people may know, like she was the first uh, female choreographer. I mean, kind of full-fledged female choreographer who um, was able to, uh, you know, stand on her own, um, kind of on her own, like creativity. You know, started in the industry at a very young age as a child actor, then as a background dancer, and then. Um, you know, as an assistant choreographer and then a choreographer who then also, of course, has trained many other people. So um, she, you know, has her life is kind of a fascinating look into also the evolution of the Hindi film industry itself. Um, and uh, it's and I think often when globally, when people think of, quote, Bollywood um, and they think of song sequences, um, most of the iconic song sequences that kind of represent uh, popular Hindi cinema, uh, you know, in the last few decades have been those um, choreographed by her, right? Um, and also in terms of the female stars whose stardom uh, in no part, I mean, in very much has, has had a lot to do with the kind of choreography she, um, you know, she kind of bequeathed them, right? So people like, you know, stars like Sri Devi and Madhuri Dixit and even, you know, Aishwarya Rai, they have a lot, um, you know, they're beholden to her kind of guidance and choreography because so much of Hindi film heroines, you know, in the last few decades, or actually many, many decades, uh, so much of their stardom is also connected to uh, their song sequences and their dancing abilities. So I'll just stop there because I'm sure we'd like to hear from from our team. Thank you, Gandhi, yes. for walking us through our journey. So I would like to invite our researchers and contributors, uh, Arpita Bajpay and Meeta Bandhu to uh, actually give us a little introduction about their papers. 
especially uh, like arpita bajpay in enflashment of modern filmy heroine and meeta bandopadhyay from kalans to uh, from uh, her early movies to uh, the making of modern indian dance so please uh, meeta do you want to go first no you go first but uh, but a so i give you the privilege to have thank so. you um <laughs> sure so um i was looking at saroj khan's uh later work so sort of from the late 90s to the end of the 20s so starting with tal uh and going on to guru um i was interested in, in looking at sort of what i think is probably the peak of her career so after she really makes the big after tezab in 1988 um i i see sort of that first decade of the 2000s as sort of a golden era where she's doing a lot of work um and working with very big stars still like madhuri and aishwarya as um, they just when mentioned um mm, what i was interested in for this paper uh was looking at how she saroj khan is drawing on a number of different repertoires um that all sit in her body that she deploys in really clever ways um to enflesh the heroines she's working with um so really again thinking about song and dance sequences as um these sort of liminal ambiguous spaces within the the um time of a film uh where a, a female character or heroine who doesn't necessarily get a lot of dialogue or isn't always a very um crucial character on screen has a moment um to embody a, a song's dialogue or lyrics yes but it's saying a lot more with how she's occupying space and moving um and saroj khan i think is um she knows her craft very well because she knows how to play to the camera how to work with an established heroine's character and her setting um so even if it's not i think like the sort of um campier numbers of the 80s and 90s uh i was looking at films that are working with very sort of quote unquote traditional heroines or heroines who are set in a historical past um so it kind of knows how to draw on a sort of folk or classical repertoire um and use that really to still hold a film's audience's attention um and communicate that the heroine is still a, a modern and desirable heroine through her dancing so i'll stop there though Meeta, please go ahead and give us your thoughts on okay. your paper. Okay. First, I want to wish a very good morning to John Timam and Arpita as well. And uh, as my paper goes, I have tried to focus on uh, modern Indian dance. For that matter, dance in India started during the second millennium BC in the Indian Natya Shastras. If you go back and look at the Natya Shastras, we'll find that. Uh, the kathak dance is there the rules and regulations of kathak dance is there but uh, the dance at that stage was strictly limited to the worship of the deity for example uh, the ras leela performed in the temples but uh, slowly as time proceeded we find several changes coming into the dance form one of the changes that we notice is the mudra style that came uh, during the reign of uh, aurangzeb uh, mughal empire in india that specific dance form differed from the traditional kathak dance form uh, in the sense that uh, to a very little extent it showed a different type of body movement and it was uh, mainly for the male audience who used to come and visit the mahals of the kotas of the tawaifs so there we find a little bit of shift other than that uh, there was uh, no much shift noticed in the dance in india but it was uh, saroj khan who first introduced a big shift in her dance performance it was uh, her dance mainly focused on the heroines there were very few male heroes who performed to her uh, who performed in her 
choreography. As far as the females are concerned, they were mostly Shri Devi and uh, Madhuri. Madhuri covering the maximum, and uh, to a certain extent Aishwarya as well. So what we find, if we go back again to the Indian dance style, there we will find that uh, there is a specific um, means. The Navaratnas, which uh, the, uh, the Navarasa, sorry, uh, there are nine rasas in the Indian dance tradition. And uh, uh, I cannot uh, tell about all the rasas right now. So I'll basically um, put emphasis on the rasa called the Shingara. Uh, you, Shingara is related to romance, Shingara is related to attractiveness and sexual innuendos. But as the early dance forms were mainly performed in the temples, so it was basically of the devotional pattern. And what Saroj Khan did, she brought the sensuality within the Indian dance uh, structure, uh, mainly through her body movement movements which are called the matkas and uh, chatkas the movement of the upper portion of the body the movement of the lower portion of the body and we find a very uh, rhythmic dance movement it is not at all slow uh, slow in very few cases if we go to the uh, film devdas song um, and uh, very few cases, but most of them are very fast, rhythmic. They show body movement. And another thing that uh, she focuses on her dance is chehra bolta hai ki nahi. The means the eyes, the face, the hands. There should be a certain synchronization of the movement so as to express the emotion. She even taught dance to her students while being seated. So more than the body movement, it is the facial movement, the movement of the eye, as I had said, which is creates a demarcation between the Indian dance style and the Western dance style. If we go and look in the Western dance style, the eye and the hand, the eye movement, the facial movement, the neck movement are not that much as compared to what we find in the Indian dance style. But what was lacking in the Indian dance style is uh, the confidence, the sensuality. That is what uh, Saroj Khan tried to put in all her dance. And especially uh, she did that first in her dance of uh, Mr. India, Kate Nahi Kate. Uh, that there is a dance and I have uh, elaborated on few of her dances, uh, explaining the dance movement. And I have tried to show in my paper how this modernity has been introduced through Saroj Khan in her dance. Means the ancient was there, it's a hybrid style, keeping the ancient intact and along with it fusing uh, the, the nuances, for example, uh, the body movements which she coined. And another thing is uh, looking at the eye of the camera, which she considered to be very important. And uh, due to her mastery at dexterity in all these skills, she even choreographed South Indian song in the film Singara, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, there were several South Indian Bharatnatyam dancers. It was Saroj Khan who came up with her choreography and she backed the national award. That is how her dance is a shift from the traditional Indian dance. So that is what I have tried to show how she introduced the modernity, the modern female who is way ahead of the ancient female. Uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you. So, uh, there are, thank you, Ms. Bandupada. There are a few key takeaways from these papers that we would return to. But first, I would like to know about uh, Professor Gandhi's perspective on these papers. Please, Professor Gandhi, please share your thoughts on these. All right. OK, thank you. Um, like I said, I really enjoyed reading your essays. And you know, especially, as I said, it was really fun to revisit the songs. And my first love has always been Hindi film song and dance. Um, now, I, um, so I have to uh, make the point that I'm an anthropologist, um, not a film studies scholar. So as an anthropologist, I'm always really um, more interested in what's off screen than what's on screen. right? And I actually, through my research in the Hindi film industry, I've had the chance to observe a number of choreographers or, or dance directors. So like Farah Khan, Ahmed Khan, Shamit Tawar, Jay Borade, and even Saroj Khan. But I didn't have the um, good fortune to observe her too much. I, I saw her on the set of one particular film. 
And what I've always been struck by is their capacity to create or choreograph on the spot, in the moment, like their ability to improvise based on the capabilities of the actor that they're working with. So one of my comments for both of the papers is that I think it's really important to recognize that the dance, I'm just gonna use dance director because that's you know what was always used in the, in the film industry. Um, even now it's used in the film industry most of the time. So um, the dance director isn't involved in the process of making the song, right? The, or the composing of the songs, like say like the music sittings or the recordings. Um, and often that the dance director doesn't actually have access to the song, it's music or lyrics much before the actual shoot begins. So often, I mean, uh, the choreography often comes together on the set or on location. Of course, really elaborate choreography with lots of background dancers will obviously, um, you know, the, da the dance director will, you know, it's planned, it's rehearsed. So the background dancers do a lot of rehearsal, whereas the star comes on set often and like, that, you know, learns it on, like on the set. But the blocking of the, the blocking of the steps, the relationship of the choreography to the camera and the shot breakdown, right, all happens on the set. And for dance directors of Saroj Khan's generation, the majority of their careers, they did not work with video assist technology. What that means is they didn't have the benefit of seeing what the shoot looked like on the camera instantaneously. So the first time I saw a video assist monitor on a film set in Bombay was for, say, for a song sequence was in 2000. And actually it was Saroj Khan who was sitting in front of the video assist and, you know, it was a... Um, it was that film with uh, Aishwarya Rai and uh, Abhishek Bachchan called Kuchnakoho that was directed by Rohan Sikhi. So, so I, just thinking about the kind of sort of conditions and constraints that dance directors for Hindi films operate in also helps to make sense of the repertoire, right, of movements and gestures that appear frequently in Hindi films, right? Because they have to, they have to kind of call on kind of an existing, um, a set of repertoires because of often how you know quickly they have to kind of uh, create on the spot. Um, so that also can help us kind of make us appreciate even more the immense skill of a choreographer like Saroj Khan who has given so many memorable dance sequences, right? Also the other thing, other comment I have regarding the analysis of dance sequences is also to pay attention to the editing and camera angles. And that, and that choreographing for the camera is very different, right, than choreographing for the stage or like of our live performance. And but that so much of our response and reaction to a song has been shot and edited along with the, you know, shaped by how a song has been shot and edited along with the choreography. Um, and so I was just thinking, Mita, when you just said about the importance, of, of course, Indian dance, you know, because there's the abhinaya, like the importance of facial expressions is there throughout all of the various forms, you know, classical forms of Indian dance. But also one of the things to think about is that, um, you know, in that sense, you know, dancing for the camera, um, it's not surprising that, you know, the kind of emphasis on facial expressions can actually be even more enhanced because of, you know, of choreographing for the camera, right? So to kind of think about the relationship, not just about what's happening in the dance form, but to think about how the, you know, film technology kind of mediates um, the practice of choreography, right? Like, so that, I just think that's something kind of important to keep in mind. Now I have a um, few main questions and I'm sure more will emerge kind of through our conversation. But two terms keep coming up over and over again in both of your papers, um, modern or mod and modern slash modernity and hybrid. And um, I'd like to hear more about what you mean by these terms, because to my mind, they're not self-evident or transparent and can mean many different things. And also, again, this is me because I'm an anthropologist. I'm always interested, and I'm probably we're interested in how the categories and classifications come to take on the kind of uh, significance and meaning. We don't, you know, so it's like that's part of, you know, that's, so to me, modern is not something that immediately, like, you know, modern can index many different things depending on the context. So I want to hear more, like, what exactly do you both mean by the term modern in the context that you're analyzing, right? How are you defining modern? And also just realize that when it comes to dance, um, you know, 
saying like the Western context, modern is actually a specific genre of dance, right? So with respect, you know, so that it's just, you know, modern versus ballet or versus jazz or versus tap, right? Um, so that in the world of dance, modern also has a very, can have a very specific reference. I know you're not talking about that per se, but I just wanted to kind of call your attention to that. And of course, same with the term hybrid as well. I'd like to hear and kind of more about how you're defining that term. And also, um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of the history of how, I mean, and um, uh, Sumita Chakravarti, film scholar who wrote National Identity in Indian Realist Cinema, like, uh, you know, was looking at the 1950s period. And she actually talks about how the term hybrid gets lobbed against both, you know, the music of Hindi cinema, as well as the dance sequences, right? And hybrid was seen as this pejorative term, like hybrid dance, hybrid music, right? It was seen as this thing that, um, you know, like it generated part of the kind of moral panic around, uh, the, you know, Hindi film music and Hindi film dance, right? So I just, I think that, so again, so that term hybrid is something, there is a history to how that term is getting used within the history of song, film, song and dance. Um, so I feel like that's also no, another important uh, kind of factor to kind of keep in mind. So one of the kind of main points with this line of questioning I have is of course, um, one needs to be more precise with how terms are used, right? So like folk and classical, again, I think those need to be interrogated rather than taking them for granted. Because again, in the space of film dance, right? The presentation of folk and classical is going to be different than what one finds like in a school, right? Um, and frequently the referent is other film dances, right? So there's a particular way that like folk, like there's like, you know, like a folk dance appears in a film, which would be different than say a bunch of people, you know, getting together and doing something, you know, kind of in a community. Although of course the constant like uh, traffic between like cinema and society that happens in India so that, you know, people like then uh, create folk dances based on what they've seen in film. So, you know, again, so that, that category, so again, that category itself is not this, you know, this kind of standalone discrete transparent category. That's what I mean. Like these are not self-evident categories. These are categories that have to get interrogated, defined, kind of fleshed out. Um, and also I think, you know, it's interesting because Saroj Khan's entire training, right, or school was the film industry, it, you know, she never like was formally trained by like, you know, in the kind of a whole other system. Like she learned, I mean, you know, when you watch the documentary about her, she is, she's kind of like an autodidact, right? She, you know, she's this young child who like has this particular gift for movement and that's kind of, you know, noticed and she gets, she keeps being put in these like dance sequences and she has this kind of, you know, amazing talent which is recognized and then, you know, like just her old, like, and then, you know, she does, of course, kind of as a backer apprentice with Sohanlala in one sense, right? And like, you know, that he's her guru and, you know, she, but she's learning by doing kind of, but on film sets, right? So, so her, so that whole idea of like how, I mean, so, you know, how she's trained, it's through the medium of cinema, right? So I think then we need to kind of think about how you know like her interpretation of what counts as classical and her interpretation of what counts as folk and our understandings kind of as lay people is also completely mediated through hindi cinema right um and so i you know so that's so she's like steeped in film dance um and so Arpita, i know that on page five like you have you mentioned that while women who dance desire have historically been socially marginalized as vamps the modern heroine ex escapes this condemnation so I have a question, I was like, why do you think so? And also I was wondering, is it that the gaze of the analyst has changed? So the analyst is now more interested in excavating the heroine's agency rather than condemning popular cinema for its male gaze, right? So like, have we shifted, we've kind of moved from the Laura Mulvey, you know, moment into like a new moment where, you know, where like, it's not so much it's not so much like, I mean, I'm not saying, like, of course, like, you know, dance and, you know, and representations of women have changed, but I wonder how much of that changes also kind of how much the analyst, you know, has changed as well as how much kind of popular discourse around um, dance has changed. 
I wonder how much, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, there are these uh, kind of practices of recognizing, legitimating, you know, you know, from starting from like the Filmfare Award, also like national awards, right? Like getting awards, recognizing choreography as an important dimension, like, you know, how much of that also uh, plays in and rather than just about the representation of the heroine. And, um, you know, and uh, Mita, with your point, you were talking about, you know, sensuality. And I just want to caution you because you kind of present this very long, you know, it's a very, um, this kind of narrative of like starting, you know, from the Nakti Sastras to Saroj Khan. And I want to kind of caution you that, you know, you make it seem like somehow until Saroj Khan, nothing had happened. Like, you know, and, and or like nothing had changed. Um, and I want to caution you against that kind of, a simple historical narrative because um, that implies that like, you know, things stay static and, you know, like over millennia. And also remember, how do we actually understand and know about what was happening in the past? We don't have, we don't have access to something a thousand years ago except through other forms of um, representation. So whether it's, you know, like temple sculptures or whether it's like, you know, miniature paintings or, you know, ancient texts. So, um, so I think that it's, I, I wouldn't draw this kind of direct line. And also I do want to meant, you know, so like put aside all of this classical kind of, uh, or kind of ancient texts and think about like the context where Saroj Khan emerges from, which is again, like really it's about the history of Hindi cinema. And, you know, even earlier, like, so there have been other, you know, so Usha Ayer's work, which I noticed that you both, um, you know, had cited it in, in your bibliography. I mean, she has this fascinating uh, discussion of this, um, of the dancer Azudi, right, in the 30s, and who was this kind of very, like, um, I can't remember her parentage. She was, like, extremely mixed, and, you know, she was this, like, dancer, Madame Azudi, and, like, you know, and, and, and she was, uh, there was a lot of like discussion about her and like, you know, and how uh, the kind of grace and sensuality that she brought um, to the screen, right? So there have been other instances. And also, I just want to say this notion of, you know, the idea that somehow Saroj Khan introduced sensuality into Hindi's film dance. Um, dance has always been a site of a great deal of anxiety and moral panics. You know, going all the way back, I mean, definitely use the British, the Brit you know, the British were extremely anxious about, you know, what they call the notch girls, right? So they that, you know, the British um, were constantly trying to legislate and, you know, and they 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 were they were very anxious. So, you know, what they saw is like, you know, kind of um, quote oriental debauchery with the idea of like these dancing women, right? So like the dancing women in the 18th century and the 19th century, you know, the British were extremely anxious about that. And there was a moral panic as well as, you know, even later, I mean, you think about like the Devdasi, the anti-Devdasi legislation. Um, so there's always been, uh, so like, I think dance has always, you know, women dancing. And why is it that, you know, there are, you know, why is it like hereditary performers? Why did, you know, why were women who danced kind of socially kind of bracketed off? Like, you know, only certain women were dancing, right? So because they were seen, so, so they were seen as somehow threatening. And what was part of that threatening was exact, exactly the fact of, you know, dance has always been seen as sensual, I think. Um, so, and hence it also had to be kind of either cordoned off, like, you know, only certain people could do it or in cordoned off in certain spaces of a place, right? So, um, I, I, so I, I, I would, uh, I would kind of, uh, you know, question that, that kind of uh, strand of argumentation that you were having in your paper. And finally, um, I think back to kind of what I said, like I'm so I'm more interested in the off screen. I think it's really important and I would want to hear more from you all about like situating Saroj Khan kind of in the larger field of choreography and dance tech directors, right? So she, because her kind of brand, right? She was marked and kind of understood as the one that you call upon when you want quote more traditional or quote more Indian, like, you know, more Desi choreography, right? So if you want the kind of Mujra, you want the, some kind of, you know, Kathak style, like, you know, you call, um, you know, you call Sarojji is that, you know, notion. Whereas um, there are, you know, uh, choreographers like Farah Khan or Shamak Dabar, you know, um, Ahmed Khan, and now you have the whole new set, you know, like 
being able to do that. Like, you know, like those are the ones you call upon when you want what I think in within industry parlance, right, would be seen as like the more global style or the, you know, so, so I, you know, and like, so that's just something to kind of think about like her, her kind of role and space within the larger field of choreography in the film industry. And also kind of th to think about, you know, her legacy in terms of like other people that she's trained as well as kind of what kind of impact has she left upon, you know, contemporary choreography. So I feel like those are other things that, you know, would be interesting to kind of explore. So that those are kind of my comments that I have for both of you kind of, you know, and um, I'll stop there and, you know, can have a conversation about this. Thank you, Professor Gandhi, for your valuable opinions. I'm sure they will be certainly taken uh, by our researchers, contributors, and editorials. So, uh, Ms. Vajpayee and Ms. Bandopade, would you like to explain your stance on the concerns raised by Professor Gandhi? Sure. Uh, if you don't mind, Nita, I can go first. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, first, thank you, um, Professor Gunthi. I think those are excellent questions. And um, I think I shared the paper with a few friends after I, I wrote it. Modernity was definitely an issue that they raised with me. Um, and in retrospect, I really do wish I'd added another paragraph there. Um, but I, I think, to be honest, I could have written double the length of, of what that paper was. Um, but to speak to modernity, um, I'm thinking of modernity specifically in this context um, as something that is is ambiguous uh, and is not necessarily a binary set against traditional. Um, I think in the post-colonial context of India and even its diaspora, you could say, um, what modernity means, especially in gendered terms, because this was so much part of, uh, sorry, I'm getting a call. Um, what this means for um sorry i'm just gonna no hang on i knew this would happen at exactly this time <laughs> sorry uh i think what this what modernity means um in a, a gendered context uh like i said because the the figure of sort of the respectable respectable indian woman was so much part of the nationalist movement mm -hmm. Um, and dance was also very much a part of that, right? Dance and music. Um, she was somebody who embraced a, a certain kind of traditionality, a, a sanskariness, right? That was was read as very much Hindu. Um, and she was somebody who was still uh, mobile. And I mean that uh, socially, mostly, um, perhaps economically. And I think that definitely started to happen uh as time went on um and you know uh like into the 50s and 60s as women started to move out into um the public more than they had in say the 20s or 30s um but i i think you see this in film as well is that heroines um from like the 40s to the 60s are, are really sort of occupying this space between the binary of tradition and modernity they have to embrace a certain kind of idealized vision of um, of what it means to be a good uh, Indian woman, which is typically read as Hindu. Um, and she has to sort of be subservient to the patriarchy. She can push back against it a little bit, but not too much. Um, she has to be demure to a certain extent, right? So I think um, modernity, as I'm using it, is, is negotiating all of these things at once. Um, and so when I think about Saroj Khan creating a, a modern heroine uh, in the late 90s into the 2000s, uh, there's a lot that's happened in between, of course, as well. Um, but I think it's with sort of this understanding of uh, a more globally mobile woman, um, even in, in the context of Ligon, right? I think uh, Gauri is somebody who is able to sort of hold her ground uh, when the English woman and the British are around, right? Um, and I mean, that that might be a different conversation, but that's sort of how I was thinking about modernity. Um, and I, I'm really happy also that you raised uh, these other terms, hybrid, um, folk, classical, right? Um, 
I, I honestly haven't read enough about hybridity to comment more about it. So I'm, I'm going to step back from that one. Um, but I think classical and folk, I was, you're right. I, um, they aren't terms to be taken lightly and they mean different things in different contexts. Um, I, I'm using classical very much drawing upon um, relatively recent literature um, like Balabi Chakravarti, Margaret Walker, Davish Soneji, um, right, who people like Anna Morkham and uh, Usha Iyer are drawing upon. Mm -hmm. Um, so thinking about classical as something that is very much a 20th century mm -hmm. creation that is uh, drawing upon this sort of uh, linear narrative of being connected to an ancient past. Um, you know, the Nati Shastra is sort of rediscovered in the late 19th century and gets, uh, you know, sewn into these dances as they are remade uh, upon bodies of um, upper caste and upper and middle class men and women. Um, so I'm very much thinking about it in that sense. And I'd actually taken out a paragraph um, that was talking about Gatuk specifically, as you see it on film in um, the 40s, mm -hmm. uh, where people like Sohan Lal, uh, who are trained in Gatuk, yeah. right, yeah. Um, are, are choreographing for the screen. Even um, I think it's Achan Maharaj who did Piyar Kiya To Darna Kiya. The the quality of the movements mm -hmm. when I first watched it, even Bakisa for that matter, um, I guess the background here is I'm I'm trained in Gatuk. Um, but my my understanding of a classical body, when I watch those numbers, I'm like, oh, you know, their movements are so loose. Yes. Um, and, yeah. And right? Yeah. And but um I think that just kind of goes to show that like that was Gatuk for for film though, right? So <laughs> Uh, you know, there, there's a negotiation that's happening there between repertoire, between um, the choreographer's body, assist, assistance bodies, the camera, uh, and what an audience is expecting. Um, and so, I, like, I think that negotiation is very interesting because um, there's raging debates about, you know, what does it mean to perform a Bollywood number in in a on stage as a classical dancer, sure, right? Sure. There's there's gatekeeping that's happening there, um, and you know these issues are tied up in questions of identity, um, power, you know, aesthetics, um, and I so I think there's a lot going on there, um, and I guess when I'm I'm using these terms in my paper, um, I, I understand that there's a lot of of um, ambiguity about what they mean in different contexts. And I think that's really fascinating. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, what Instagram and TikTok are doing to classicality and what it means to be able to take um, a mudra that, you know, Saroj Khan has choreographed and classicize it, mm -hmm. right, uh, for TikTok or something like that. Like, what is that doing? And what is that saying about filminess, about aesthetics about identity about classicality um yeah I, and like this isn't really something i discussed in the paper but these are these are things that um i think her work opened up in a lot of ways mm -hmm. right it made these things possible um and so how she in some ways kind of democratized choreography that was um enticing for audiences to to take up with their own bodies is uh, I think something Barumitra Vohra has kind of written a little bit about too, um, but but yeah, that might be going on on a tangent. Um, so in terms of um, your question specifically about the representation of the heroine and whether the the modern heroine escapes uh, condemnation, um, it is probably a lot to do with my own gaze. Uh, <clears throat> sure, like I'll, I'll admit that happily. Um, but I do think that, you know, a film like even Devdas, right, where Chandra Mukhi is a, she's a performing woman, right? Mm -hmm. And sure, like, it's based on a novella that is, you know, a century old. Um, but I think her character in Banzali's telling isn't necessarily punished for being a mm -hmm. public woman, right? Mm -hmm. She has the chance to speak back. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, so I think there is a shift and I, I do think that Saroj Khan is, is part of that because I think after Tezab and the numbers that she produced subsequently, there was this real desire in audiences to see those kinds of numbers. 
Um, and because of that, the heroine is able to occupy slightly different spaces. And I, I think like item numbers are an interesting ambiguous spot now too, right? Because sometimes the heroine will perform it, sometimes she won't, depending on um, who it is. And I mean, like, I'm not sure what those discussions are, but I'm always fascinated when there is an item number in a film and it's not the heroine who's doing it. Sure. Um, so I, and I guess the interesting thing about like a guest item number is that it's a, it's just a cameo, right? That we don't see a repercussion for that performance uh, on screen at least. Um, and uh, in terms of Suroj Khan's legacy, and I will kind of wrap up here quickly. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, like I didn't realize that she was kind of um, tagged as a, a more traditional choreographer, and I can kind of see how that would work. Um, I, that probably wasn't the case in the '90s, maybe. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, right, um, and also thinking that like she Farah Khan worked with her, um, so I think her legacy has kind of been picked up in different ways. Even, um, you know, Gajirare, which wasn't choreographed by her, I think you can see where Saroj Khan has left her imprint on the field uh, in, sure. in an hour like that. Um, I just want to respond to, Sonal, I just want to respond to a couple of things that Arpita said before we move to Mita. So one thing I want to mention, Arpita, that, you know, um, like, so when it comes to, say, like the item numbers or some of these other song sequences, vis-a-vis -vis the narrative, you have to realize that often, um, like the item number can actually have you know can be thought of like after the narrative has actually been yeah you know, like the script is written and then it's like could be it could be a reason like a marketing reason or some other reason so that you know so the fact and the fact that you don't necessarily as you said like there's no repercussion like I, it's not surprising because sometimes it's just literally like let's do this as a way of marketing the film if you notice so many item numbers now are just there at the end credits right like they're not even in the film anymore and also the other thing about the hair i mean so realize that the dance director the choreographer is has i mean in all the times I have been in watching kind of production and like and pre-production is not involved in the scripting, right? right. Um, even the music director is not, you know, so it's like the screen, it's really the screenwriter and the director together who are like figuring out the screenplay and the and the thrust of the narrative. So, so in that sense, kind of, uh, you know, I would be a little wary to kind of attribute that, you know, that kind of the narrative points that you're making about like what is the hero like you know what the dance enables the heroine to do within the narrative like you know I think there's a lot of extra narrative you know emphasis and also the kind of the how heroine is embodied you know through the song I think that's you know that's definitely an important part but in terms of um you know the like the kind of nature of what this the dance is doing to the narrative I would it's not necessarily that, right so like that's something I want to mention and also I do think all of the points that you just mentioned in terms of like how how classicism itself is being kind of constructed is actually really bad so I mean my kind of you know um suggestion is and maybe you're already doing this in your kind of larger work is like all of this other you know like these things that are extra textual right like they're they're not what is just on screen like all of these other negotiations or all of these other mediations that you're talking about you know in terms of i mean i feel like that becomes um i feel like that becomes really interesting right to kind of investigate and also the last thing is remember i mean you're right like the way the way modernity the discourses of modernity especially in india have been have always been around gender always i mean from like the social reform movements in the 19th century it has always been around women's bodies right so and also i mean in the world generally like how do we think about uh you know is a country modern like how do we think about like is a country index of modern it's like oh let's look at the status of women right so i mean so the question of modernity and the question of gender are completely you know interlinked right so i mean and so i just like wanted to kind of push you more on that so anyway but those are just some thoughts i have Ms. Uh, Pandu Padday? Mita? We're waiting for you. Yeah, hi. Hey, Ma'am, can you please repeat the question? Because the connection is very poor in my area. I'm not, I was not able to follow you entirely. Oh, so dear. can you please put forward the question again? 
Uh, wow. Okay. So I had many questions. Um, so I guess um, I think specifically for you, uh, I will just say, you know, I had been asking both of you actually how you categorize or define modern and hybrid. But those These are terms that are not necessarily just, um, you know, self-evident, as I said. And also I wanted, to, I, I was actually kind of uh, pushing you to not like portray this kind of continuity starting from the Natya Shastra to, you know, Sarojka. Like, I feel like the history of dance and the history of, you know, is much more complicated than this, like, linear narrative, right? And also, I guess the issue is to kind of think about Saroj Khan's work in the history of cinema, right, um, and the history of film dance, because you've had other You've had other, uh, you know, dancers slash choreographers in the 30s who were also celebrated for their kind of being very cosmopolitan. They were very global. So like someone like Azuri, Madame Azuri was like, you know, celebrated as this very cosmopolitan global kind of icon, you know, through her dance moves. So I, I guess I was just, it was just more comments about, you know, being a little bit more precise with how these terms are being used and also kind of, Thinking about thinking about Saroj Khan's work with respect to film dance rather than all dance in India, because she she is like she's she's trained through film dance, right? Um, so that I mean, so I, I yeah, I, um, there were so many things I said. I don't know if I can like repeat everything because I'm just looking at the time. Could you hear? Did you hear at least? Something. Yeah, ma'am, partially I could uh, because the connection is very weak, as I said. So as far as I could make out, uh, you wanted me to define uh, why it means uh, hybridity and modernity. Is it something like that? Sure, sure, yeah. Well, okay, what do you, yeah, what as far do you mean as that, uh, yeah. I, I understand... Uh, yeah, as far as I understand, hybridity is uh, bringing together, putting together two distinct things. One that already existed and uh, one that I'm putting into. So uh, I think that uh, the dance style which Saroj Khan uh, put forward in her choreography is something that existed in India all throughout. But she also introduced something new uh, because if she hadn't introduced it, see, uh, if we consider the dance choreography by Sohan Lal, uh, it was not that much distinct in that as we find it in Saroj Khan uh, means the female the confidence uh, that the female heroine show in front of the camera they are much more uh, means camera oriented camera focus their body movements body movements were initially also there but uh, there is a marked change if we go back and look at the dance of the uh, 1960s, 1970s, and if we come and look at the dance of uh, 1990s, there is a change in the spontaneity, and that change uh, we find in the uh, heroine, not in the um, what to say, the negative role means. Uh, the vampire roles, the villainous roles, but in the heroines. And uh, that is what brings out the positivity of Saroj Khan. And as far as hy hybridity is concerned, it's the putting together of the old and new into a new form. Means mm, dance, uh, Kathak was there, but what Saroj Khan did to Kathak dance is she introduced the... Mm, she introduced something more, I cannot define it, but uh, she introduced um, many things which made her dance stand distinct and modern in the sense something that is uh, applicable to the global citizen means uh, as we are getting global, it's a capitalistic society. So people are open through uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook and the internet has made us open to various things happening. So it is generally to keep with the market, to keep with the commercial market, that uh, some changes has been done in the dance form so that it becomes appealing to the people. Uh, even if we go and see the traditional classical dance, means the classical dance that is taught to the students and one that is uh, we find in the cinemas is markedly different, and that is what it that that is what shifts. Uh, that is the shift that we notice uh, brought forward by uh, Saroj Khan. 
that's it man i that that's it i can define okay so i just so i'm just i'm just going to push you is that cinema mm -hmm. from the beginning is a hybrid and a global form right mm -hmm. so in the sense and and that's what i was saying earlier like you know in the 50s in the 1950s there was a lot of criticism against film song and film dance and they can, and one of the main forms of criticism is to call it hybrid right so and and also cinema itself i mean cinema from the beginning has been a global form in 1895 when you had the lumiere brothers have their first screenings in 6 months the screening you know you have them in india right you have them in the same day that you have the first film screenings in india you have them in st petersburg you have them in i believe rio right so cinema from the outset has been global right so to say that now cinema is global would be actually uh, inaccurate uh, uh, characterization it is a technology mm -hmm. so it is a technology so cinema is a very much a it is modern right so it is a modern technology so the very fact once mm -hmm. you put dance on screen So even the dance mm -hmm. like you know from the 20s it's a modern it's a modern uh kind of representation of something right because you you know you're putting it on a camera you're you're screening it right so the very fact of the technology itself is already kind of changing changing it you have you can't dance for the camera the same way that you would dance like for you know in front of a live audience right so 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 i'm just i'm just asking you know i'm just kind of pushing you to kind of um interrogate these very kind of um these kind of characterizations that keep getting thrown out you know as like somehow that the present right now everything is like become so different and changed you know um and actually both of you be fine i mean it's interesting when you're like because you're talking also about the heroines you know if you look at the 1930s the heroines in the 1930s were way more um kind of like for lack of a better word I'll just like we'll see just like so much more kind of progressive and you know those and those films were much more quote feminist than like you know what you saw in the 40s or 50s or 60s or even like in the 90s the 90s were definitely a pretty conservative time when you look at at film so that's so that's so that's what I you know so and then hybrid of course yes it's a mix but what I'm saying is that um you know cinema and hindi cinema especially like think of all of the things that it's drawing from and first its most immediate immediate cultural predecessor is farsi theater and farsi theater itself is already a hybrid form right it is like you know performing plays by shakespeare but in urdu right and there are people you know so i'm just saying that the history of hindi cinema from the beginning has been a global hybrid modern form so that's that's you know i just want to kind of um make sure that that we don't fall into these kind of very um uh convenient like dichotomies that keep getting you know put there put out there especially when it comes to anything about india right these like dichotomies of traditional and modern um which are which are not actually very helpful because what they do is they completely uh they completely um uh, paint over all the kind of complex interconnections and interactions that have been happening for centuries you know among between lots of people and as arpita already mentioned i mean the idea of dance becoming a classical form is something that actually gets uh you know it actually gets put forth in the 19th century and at late 19th century actually early 20th century with the nationalist movement where it's like okay we need to like put forth we need to create quote a national classical culture i mean the idea of bharatnatyam as like a national classical dance is something that gets forged in the 20th century with and a very particular middle class project right middle class nationalist project to kind of san sanitize like the performing arts which are kind of seen as like you know those people those hereditary performers are kind of seen as disreputable it's like let's bring it into the space of the respectable let's have like middle class women start singing and dancing that you know so that's a whole project that you know that has a very particular history um that doesn't go back you know to the bc it like it is it goes back only a few hundred years so I, that's what i wanted to kind of call your attention to yeah i hope you heard some of that <laughs> i don't know how the but how the connection has been but anyway that's just something i wanted to point out yeah i'll put that yeah if i could just add to that i think um like what you start to see and part of the reason why film is is su such a touch point and such a contentious issue 
um, especially when you get into the 40s and 50s when um, a formal Indian state starts to kind of have more purview over it, um, is that, you know, a lot of the lives, a lot of women from hereditary performing communities in the North and South go into film because they've been pushed out of spaces of legitimate patronage um, thanks to the anti-notch movement in, in the 19th century and then the formal sort of Dave Dossi Abolition Act uh, into, in the 30s. Um, but they bring with them a very mixed repertoire, right? Uh, and Soniji's work is really interesting on this count um, where you have women who are performing uh, in courtly spaces, right, in the South, who are learning from the vibes, mm -hmm. right? Or they're taking um, Scottish marching tunes and performing to those, right? Um, and so they're taking all of this bodily knowledge onto the space of um, the screen. Um, and also to kind of, it, it gets back to that issue of gender and modernity, but it also brings caste into the question, right? Part of the reason why these women were disreputable was because they were not upper caste. They were not from the middle class. And so they could not be sort of legitimate representatives of Indian modernity, which had to be gendered. Um, yeah, so, and I think Saroj Khan then is an interesting person in that sort of history because she she was until very recently a very liminal figure, right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, like behind screen where she's not getting a lot of the credit. Um, and uh, I think to kind of really understand her body as, as being in tune with these histories and really having learned from them, right? Like you said, on screen, you know, she's learning in these spaces um, and sort of taking them and interpreting them for each specific film that she works on really kind of shows you how much um, how much work she's doing, but also how much knowledge uh, she was working with in, in very effective and affective ways. Yeah, her biography is, I mean, fascinating, right? That the fact that she got married at 13, you know, and she like she started acting when she was like five, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's just, it's quite, it's quite incredible. And yeah, you're right. I mean, in one sense, that type, and also she she was the main breadwinner for her family. So there, so that's a history that a lot of other older, uh, you know, like earlier generations, like you know, Mina Kumari, Madhubala, Nargis, you know, they all like started, a, you know, like because and they were the main. I mean, they were the main kind of earners for their family. And that there's that whole other issue, like the you know the women who supported their families through their film work. Like that's a really you know interesting and also. Of, you know, those people put out probably exploited as well, and not, you know, in the way that the men were doing weren't, you know, so like, there's a whole other dimension there that's also really, really quite fascinating. And we've lost Mita, I think her connection was so bad that she dropped off. Sonal, do you know anything? Uh, no, ma'am, I assume so, because it's around 10 p.m. in India, so it could be. Well, yeah, I mean, I oh, she's trying to join in. Okay, all right. So I hope this discussion only takes me from here onwards because I think uh, this uh, discussion on the impact of such legacies will be the only way that we can actually pay tributes as fans. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gandhi, for guiding us as the mentor for this issue. And thank you, Ms. Bajpayee, for contributing your paper and adding to the much thought out of, of discussion on this legend. And I again uh, like to draw attention of our listeners that our TMY's review issue March is available on Amazon Worldwide and Kindle. And so please, you, you may go through the entire paper on these services. And um, again, uh, uh, on behalf of TMY's review, our deep felt gratitude to the mentor and uh, contributor for this issue. I hope, uh, uh, Okay, Ms. Bandhupadha is joining in, and I hope we will also have Ms. Koral. Well, thank Ms. you. I was going to say thank you for inviting me.